Yes, as Marietta mentioned, I titled this Love It or Leave It. So we're going to do some before and after inspiration for those problem areas in your garden that you don't, that you want to leave. But we're going to turn them into areas that you love. So I just want to show you some gardens that I've done that with uh, over the years. And before we get started with that, I have a few pet peeves I want to talk about that um, I don't love so much. So, all right, let's go. I've got a lot to talk about. I'm going to fly through this. So, drip irrigation, do you love it? Yeah? Well, um, if you love it, don't just leave it. It's not a once and done. You've got to check to see that you don't have any lines that are crimped. When you're pruning your perennials in the springtime, you've got to make sure you don't cut through those lines. And it's not really conserving water when you've got those breaks. This is in South Lake, and every Sunday I would go get my uh, lunch after church, and I would see this river of water running through the parking lot from drip irrigation. So even, you know, if, with your spray heads too. It's not a once and done. Check them. Monitor that. If you love your trees, don't leave the wires on if, they're, if they've been staked. Uh, this was at a client in South Lake, and that tree had been wired and staked for three years and it grew into the trunk of that tree so severely that it ended up killing the tree. I don't really recommend staking your trees but sometimes you know if you have a company that installs them they require that to guarantee the tree so just be sure to remove those within a year. Don't leave girdling roots on your trees as well be sure to cut those off so that you don't uh, damage the trunk of the tree or they don't. Downspout extension, something I don't really love. Um, and this, this picture on the left-hand side over there, they, it looks like they have a little creek bed, but then they put the downspout extension beside the creek bed, so that doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. But in, in the right side picture, what I would do is I would put a different elbow on that, turn it to, toward the driveway, and then I would put the edging all the way to the driveway, and then I would put cobblestone in there. So when the water comes down from the downspout, it would hit the cobblestone and go out to the driveway. So uh, those downspout edges, uh, or extensions, when they come out onto the lawn and you mow your lawn, it seems like they run over the edge of it and it squishes it and then the water can't get out and it's just something I don't love. So what I do love is doing what I call downspout creek beds. So you can see the downspout coming down the house and then it hits the cobblestone and runs through the bed and then goes out. So you don't lose your mulch and your compost every time it rains. It's running over the cobblestone and then throw some boulders in around it too and it just, and then when the plant material grows uh, nearby then it just looks like this little stream bed running through your garden. Same here, you can see how it's the, the downspout coming down by the door there and it just hits that cobblestone and it just, looks natural running through the garden. Nandina Towers. Please don't do these poor Nandinas. Um, they should be pruned once a year, one third of the shrub per year, and you take the tallest canes down to the ground and prune them at the ground. Have I done a pruning program for y'all? I think I have, I can't remember. If not, put me on the list. Um, Anyway, it just keeps them in a natural form instead of that. That's in Keller. You can see it. They're still doing it. Um, mushrooms. Yopan hollies. I love yopan holly trees, but I'm not, I don't really love them in this mushroom shape. There's windows behind there. You can't see out of the window. Um, you can't plant anything underneath of it. So what I recommend doing is letting it grow out naturally. And this took three years to do this. We just started limbing it up from the bottom and letting the top grow out naturally. And now you can see out the windows and you can plant, we planted some kaleidoscope abelias underneath of the yopon and it's zero maintenance at this point. The other, the mushroom is a lot of maintenance to keep it in that shape. All right, another pet peeve is edging that's not been put in the ground. Um, whether you're using metal or bend board, they usually come in about four inches. Three of those inches should be in the ground to stop your Bermuda from growing underneath and invading your bed. You can see here how it's already invaded the bed because it's just got a 
free reign to go right underneath that edging, and that's what Bermuda will do. So put it in the ground. <clears throat> You've got to dig a trench and then set your edging down in it. You can't just pound it into the ground or you'll smash it to smithereens. And then here, I don't care for edging against concrete. Your concrete is your edging. And so here, just having that tiny little strip of grass with that edging coming so close to the concrete, it just makes for a maintenance hassle. You, you're not going to get grass to grow in that skinny little edge. It just makes a place for weeds to grow that you don't have a tool skinny enough to even get in there. So um, again, to me, the, the concrete is the edging, and you don't need to add, install another form. Um, I uh, learned from a landscape architect that you always want the edges of your bed to look more like the back of a dolphin than the back of a camel. So what do you think about these two? I, I would be dizzy if I had to mow that snake edging. So and here again, this is in Colleyville. Um, the edging's not in the ground and it's such an odd shape. So um, again, put your edging in the ground and do nice sweeping curves like that. Sweeping curves, easy to mow. I'm all about easy mowing. You have to mow your lawn every single week, so make it the easiest thing that you have to do. <clears throat> Long sweeping curves. Again, here we are with that, that little corner right there. It's just very hard to mow into that. There's drainage that runs through this area, so it just was not functioning. So we uh, softened that curve and made an easy mowing line. And then the drainage now works because it flows across the lawn and goes through that cobble and doesn't keep washing out the bed. So please tell me this white rock mulching is not coming back in fashion. This is a brand new house in South Lake and I'm just like, ooh, what do you all think about that? Do you love it? Yeah. I can't see your faces, so I don't know. Um, I, don't, I don't love it. I don't love it. Um, large trees in the parkways. I don't love that either because it just wreaks havoc on the curbs and the sidewalks. This is a bald cypress. It should never be planted in that place. It needs to be planted next to a pond um, where they can, their roots can just go crazy. Uh, so, and I don't love when you put those little rings around your trees because they're just gonna break up sooner or later anyway. When you put it, have a little teeny tree, um, it, you know, you're thinking you need to put something around it, but you don't. Um, just mulch around it. Don't mulch up on the trunk. But eventually, as the tree grows, it's going to break apart um, any form of concrete around it. Dollar weed. It looks really pretty in a pond. This is at the Grapevine Botanic Gardens, but it is a terror in your turf. Very hard to get rid of. It loves water, so uh, maybe cut down on your watering on your lawn if you have it growing in your lawn. Or I, um, and I don't like using, I mean, 2,4-D will kill it, but I'm, I don't like to do that in my own garden because I live so close to Lake Grapevine and I have a sloping backyard. And so I'm just, I use, I heard a, an, a gardener from Ireland the other day talking about the fat method, the finger and thumb method of weeding. I love that. So that, I use the fat method to get rid of dollar weed in my lawn. I just go out there and pull it out. You have to be very, it's very tedious. But um, just go out and pluck away. Love it or leave it. Um, so uh, there's three different ivies growing in here, but I'll just point out two of them. This is Virginia creeper, which is fine. It's very aggressive, but it's not you know, going to make you break out in a rash. This is poison ivy. So if I take this away, it's kind of hard to, to decipher which is which, but look carefully before you start pulling vines. And there's also Asian jasmine. I just noticed that back in there too. <clears throat> okay, artificial turf. What do you guys think? I never, ever would have thought that I would like artificial turf, but I have a client up in uh, Lantana that uh, they're in their 70s, maybe pushing 80, and they have a very tiny yard, and they didn't want to have to mow, and they have a pool, and they put in artificial turf, and I was quite impressed. They have come a long way with it, and it looks pretty good. 
So, all right, so now we're going to get into those problem areas and, and how I've addressed them um, for some inspiration for y'all. Um, this is my front yard back when it was nothing but dirt. So over the years, I have added gardens and perennials and shrubs and even planted along the sidewalk, the, the hell strip area. This is my backyard, uh, just uh, sloping down toward Lake Grapevine and nothing but dirt. So over the years, it took, I've been there 22 years, and, and yes, I have been on the promenade tour, which I so missed this year. Um, but I was grateful to have be on that tour and, and share my garden with everyone. Um, so this is how it looked a few years ago, and that's how it looks in the fall. And um, this, the last couple years, my oak tree has grown huge, and so I'm having trouble growing grass. So what do I do? I make more beds. So I just um, took my orange cord and laid out the line to get the shape of the bed that I want, and then I added plants that can handle part sun, part shade, because this area does get a little bit of sun, but it's mostly shade. <clears throat> so you can see my plant list there. My, one of my favorite new plants is that Everillo Carex. It's that real limey green um, grass um, in the, the background there. It grows about 18 inches tall and wide. It's a southern living plant collection plant. Um, it has just done, done so well for me. So if you find that plant, go ahead and get it. There's other uh, Carex or sedges on the market right now, but I just particularly like this one for the color. It's a grass that does well in shadier conditions. And usually ornamental grasses need full sun, but this one is for shade. So check it out. All right, this garden in uh, Grapevine had just heavy shade, very poor drainage. All of their neighbors' yards drained into this particular yard. She could not grow grass, and it was just a mud mess. So we added a creek bed, and you're going to see in a lot of these pictures, I call myself the queen of creek beds. I love doing creek beds, taking a problem with drainage and turning it into something functional and beautiful. So we added the creek bed that carries all the water from the neighbors and through her yard, and it goes all the way out to the front of her house. And then we added shade plantings. It's just a little bit um, updated. And then planted caladiums for summer uh, color. All right, this is just another view of that same area. It's just nothing is growing in there and it's such a drainage problem. So you can see how it carries all the water all the way to the front. And this is her front yard. So we just carried that creek bed all the way down to the street. And this, the front of her yard gets a lot more shade, so I mean a lot more sun, so we could add more sun toler tolerant plants up there. All right, uh, this is my next door neighbor and they're <laughs> Their front garden was pretty much every invasive, weedy plant known to man, and it did not create a very inviting environment. So we transformed that area, and you can see again, I've done the downspout creek bed. You can see where the downspout comes off the corner of the house there, and then it hits that cobblestone. And there's actually an underground drain in there as well, but this takes care of any residual, because a lot of times the underground drains, the water is coming so fast that it just can't get in there fast enough so the, the cobble, um, <clears throat> excuse me, will take a, that extra residual. You can just see the quick uh, list of plants there, Japanese maple. I love tropical giant spider lily. I like it better than crinum lilies because it holds the form so much better. Crinum lilies, a lot of times they'll come up and then they go, but the um, tropical giant spider lily holds that form. All right, this one here, uh, it's, uh, this is a lace bark elm, which is a fine tree, but this is a maybe five-year-old tree, and it's already smashed into the house. So imagine what this tree would look like in 10 years, 20 years, 40 years. So we ended up taking it out because it's just too large of a tree for that spot. So this opened up the front of her house. She gets more light in her house now. And if a tree is going to be replaced in that spot, it would be probably a crepe myrtle that would give some color but only grows maybe 12 feet and there are varieties that stay smaller so um, anyway I just would not recommend a large shade tree that close to your house so here um, we've taken some what I call lame lollipops and um, 
just a boring walk to the front door and we've transformed it with perennial plantings and then we actually put red buds on the corner. I don't have that in the picture here, but this is just how it looks as the season progresses with uh, perennials in the fall. And this is my front yard. Um, I just felt like I needed more plants, more flowers. So this is how it looks in the fall with the uh, fall aster and the salvias and ornamental grasses. And then this is how it looks in the summertime with black-eyed Susans and Phlox and Canna. So, and we all have those areas that started out full sun. And as the trees mature, this is my red oak that is now 22 years old and you know, I can barely get my arms around it. So then over the years, the, just the shade has increased. So I took out all of the lawn and I started adding flagstone and I uh, put uh, dwarf mondo in between the flagstone for the pathways and then just added Japanese maples, oak leaf hydrangeas, uh, Turks cap, akuba, lots of akuba in my garden. <clears throat> this is the front parkway strip that you know it just seems like it's always full of weeds and you've got to mow that every week so I just turned it into another garden and you, you need to check you know I don't know if Colleyville has any restrictions against this, but planting in that parkway, sometimes they don't allow that. So anyway, I, I also had <clears throat> cables that run through that area and they were just, some of them were on top of the ground and some of them were maybe an inch under the ground. So had to dig, excuse me, had to dig very carefully through that area. What I did then is I took um, and I mounted comp uh, compost right down the center of the strip and then I added small boulders and large cobblestone along the edge to hold that compost and then I planted right down that middle. And then I added, you can see along the edge, I added some flagstone along the edge so when people get out of their vehicle they don't have to step on my flowers, they can step on the flagstone. <clears throat> you can just see, it's full, everything in that garden I wanted to be under, oh, a foot, maybe a foot and a half because I've got my taller perennials behind it so I didn't want anything really tall in that strip planting. So this is just a, a picture of it in springtime. So I've got something blooming pretty much all season, maybe not in January, but from February on when I've got daffodils blooming in there, it's just successive blooming. This is a client of mine in Keller <clears throat> and the similar situation, that skinny little strip that you don't want to have to mow all the time. The retaining wall is between her yard and her neighbor's uh, driveway there. So we just planted up that little strip along her driveway so they don't have to mow that anymore. Use the same types of plantings that I used in my parkway strip because they all stayed small and it just makes that area so much more interesting. All right, this garden in South Lake, um, they, you can see where their patio uh, is there and they built the outdoor kitchen so it, it blocked their walkway through that area. So she said, now I need a walkway that goes you know, around that outdoor kitchen. So I got to looking at the area and I thought, well, those Burford hollies are blocking your window. They're a fine shrub, they're just blocking the window, so I think we can do better with that. So we added, replaced the, the uh, Burford hollies with holly fern that won't grow up high on the window. They're evergreen. And then we put the flagstone through with the dwarf mondo so that they've got a walkway through that area. It just became a really beautiful garden. So Japanese maple, that Skeeter's broom Japanese maple is a maple that grows taller than wide, so it fits those really narrow areas. Twombly's red sentinel is another variety that grows in that same, more of a columnar habit. habit. Um, again, the tropical giant spider lily in there. So just another picture of that. I like to use hostas in pots. I think they do a little bit better here. So you can see the hosta in the blue pot there. And then just added caladiums for color in the summer. This is at uh, White's Chapel Methodist Church in South Lake. And they have uh, an old homestead on the property. And this actually used to be, there used to be a pool underneath there. That's an old concrete pool decking. And they wanted to create a, a sanctuary garden. They have support group meetings at this, at this old homestead. And so they wanted people, when they came out of these meetings, to have a, a garden to go into. So we created this. Um, one of their members donated all of the um, paved stone uh, pavers for the walkways in there. And then we put a fountain. You can see there's a fountain, t a three uh, urn fountain in there. We put benches around it, added perennials and herbs. And then those are Natchez crepe myrtles, three of them, and then a red oak tree to grow up and block 
the building behind it. So that just turned out beautiful. And I had a, um, someone who listened to this program recently went by there and took some recent pictures. And sure enough, those Natchez and that red oak have grown so much that it's just obscuring that building now to make it even more of an enclosed garden feel. So this garden is um, in Keller and just a boring expanse of lawn and looking at uh, the fence. So they, we added um, a three-tier pond and now it's this beautiful ecosystem. She gets frogs and toads and uh, she's got koi in there and it gets uh, dragonflies that come to her garden and hummingbirds to the to all the perennials around there. So it just, and her patio is off to the right hand side here so they can sit on the patio and just enjoy that garden. This is on the other side of her yard under a large cedar elm tree. So we just created this garden. I think I've got the plant list here. Again, uh, oak leaf hydrangea, Japanese maple, um, some abelias, purple heart growing in those conditions. This is on the north side of her house. That was just a muddy mess. It's too shady to grow uh, grass there, so we added a flagstone pathway. And you know, pay attention to the sun angles in your yard over the seasons, because in the in the winter time and the you know spring and fall, the sun is in that southern angle, and then in, it starts raising. And in the middle of the summer, you know, then when the sun is dead overhead, you have different conditions in your area. So this is on the north side of her house. So as the sun went back into that southern angle, there's no sun on this garden at all. But in the summertime, there is sun. So we were able to plant on the sunny side some crepe myrtles and um, nandinas and um, some lantana. But on the shady side, we did some ferns and um, there's some variegated liriope and some clara in there that can handle those shady er conditions. This is at my church garden in South Lake, and we just had this courtyard area that was uh, just weedy grass, and it seemed to stay wet in there all the time. So we created a courtyard in there, added benches and lots of perennials, and you can see there's knockout roses that used to be in there that are no longer in there. I'll show you an updated picture of that. But it just turned this boring area into this beautiful seating, and we added a fountain in the middle of it for a focal point. So. When, and and the, off, the church offices are in this area, so it gives the, um, you know, the employees there during the week a beautiful area. So we replaced, behind the benches, we replaced the roses with Canyon Creek Abelia. They are so fragrant, and they fill the same space as the knockouts. They don't give you the same color, but they fill the same space, so you don't have to reinvent the whole planting area. And I love how they kind of grow up into a spray form with those fragrant pink blooms on them all summer long. Uh, this is also at my church garden. We had this sloping side on the southwest corner of the church, and it's almost impossible to mow that steep slope. So I had a crew come in and install, rip out the grass and then install boulders to retain that slope. Then I went in and I planted it with perennials. So this is right after it was planted. And this is uh, this last spring, so this garden is only one year old, so all the perennials are starting to fill in. And then this is the summer, um, this summer. So in one year, it has just really started growing and filling out. And again, southwestern exposure, full blasting all day hot sun. So choose your, you know, your plant material that can handle that. And I need inspiration too, and some friends um, of mine had got up to the Philbrook Museum in Tulsa and they sent a picture of this garden and uh, that's back before I, I uh, knew what I was going to do at, at my church garden on that slope and when I saw this picture I thought that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to add boulders and I'm going to add plant material spilling down that slope. Now granted the plant material is different than this and the scale is much different but it just gives you that inspiration so I'm hoping that some of my pictures today will give you spark a little bit of inspiration to you know, make a change in your garden. This is in Colleyville. This path, flagstone path, kind of went to nowhere, and that um, that's a spa in the background there. So to get to that spa, they had to walk out onto the lawn, and so if the lawn had been freshly mowed, now you've got grass clippings that you're getting in the spa, and this area is so shady. They have ornamental grasses growing in there that don't really like shade. So what we ended up doing is adding large huge flagstone that lead right to the spa so now when they walk to the spa they don't have to get grass clippings and then I also incorporated the trees 
so they don't, like in this back picture, they have to mow around each tree. So I incorporated in them into the bed and we added more shade plantings in there, um, a Japanese maple and oak leaf hydrangea and some abelias and yopons in that area. So it makes it easier to mow and they can get to the spa without tracking debris in there. This garden in South Lake, it's so overgrown. Uh, there's Burford holly in there, uh, privet, variegated privet. Both of those grow huge. And then in front of that, they've got Yopon holly. And over on the right-hand side, they've got Laura petalum that grows enormous, all crammed into this area. I mean, you, you can barely get to the front door. It's so overcrowded. So we ripped all that out and added kaleidoscope abelia and yopon hollies and perennials and again the downspout creek bed that comes off the corner of the house and takes it out onto the lawn so it's just so much more open and inviting now so this um, i love yopon holly but in this application they just trimmed it into a square hedge which hmm, not my thing so we added uh perennials and this garden need to be needed to be super super low maintenance because this gardener was not really into it she just didn't want to look at a hedge anymore so it needed to be very low maintenance all right this garden in um i think this is colleyville too uh, just huge erosion situation behind them is a two acre property that all drains into this yard and they have so many old mature trees here they could not grow turf grass anymore so you can see all the roots from the trees so they're you know what what can we do this so what do i do creek bed so the mouth of this creek bed is like 10 feet wide to handle all that water that's coming in way up back by that back fence. So it comes underneath the fence, it flows through this area. We added boulders to create some beds along the creek bed so it wasn't just a straight trough of, of cobblestone. So then you can see it as it's maturing. We added, again, Japanese maple, cast iron plant, oak leaf hydrangeas, all of the end ferns so that the water can carry through that garden without <coughs> excuse me without eroding <coughs> so just a picture of it in the winter time and this is the same garden across their uh, yard <coughs> same issues po lots of post oak trees lots of shade lots of erosion they needed a pathway to get down to their pool equipment but they also had uh, water flowing through that area so we added a creek bed off to the side to carry that water <clears throat> because you can't do underground drains in this type of application because you've got so many tree roots you can't dig through those tree roots and, and wreck the trees so we did the creek bed so it carries the water surface water down and um, then put the flagstone walkway with again the dwarf mondo to, to uh, get down to the pool equipment front yard same situation lots of trees lots of shade cannot grow turf grass and she wanted to be able to get an easy pathway that goes around to her garage where she keeps all of her gardening supplies so that she can plant her annual color and just go back and forth um, while she's tending her garden so we added that pathway that goes all the way around to the garage and then gave her some beautiful plantings we actually did remove a live oak from their front yard because they had three live oaks in their front yard that created so much dense shade so we kept the two outer ones and took the center one out to open up the view of the front door and give some more light so they could grow turf grass. So this is a, a client of mine in Grapevine. And um, you can see how I paint the orange lines to get the shape. I lay that out with a, with a cord, an orange electrical cord. I carry like 100 feet of electrical cord. I just lay it out, and then you can spray the orange paint. And you don't have to worry about getting it on the cord. Um, so this is during the process. It was done in January and just made a big old mess. But that's how it turned out. It's so pretty. Just that big sweep of lawn that's easy to mow. And then, again, there's a creek bed on the far side of that because the water drains through the yard that way. And it takes it all the way back out. And she backs up to core property in Lake, at Lake Grapevine. So that water can just go out and dump into the lake. This garden was actually on the promenade tour. I don't remember what year it was, but um, big garden in South, in uh, Colleyville. And... Um, Again, creek bed, um, they have a gate over on the right-hand side, so we've added a bridge over the creek bed so that goes, so they can have access to that gate that goes to a walkway behind their property. But same plants, nothing new under the sun, Japanese maples, oak leaf hydrangeas, ferns, you know, all those plants that love shade. This was their side yard that was every, uh, every a weed, tree seedling known to man was growing in this side yard as you can see 
And we, uh, there's a gate on that far side, so we needed access to that, created the pathway. Again, the same plantings um, were there. And if you notice off to the left-hand side, those Burford hollies, those are excellent shrubs, but they're growing halfway up the window. So we pulled all those out and added Yopon holly because they don't get as big, and so the maintenance is so much less. <clears throat> this was the front yard that had, uh, it's not called Eupatorium anymore, but... Um, uh, mist flower that, in, oh, it, it's a monarch magnet, but it's so invasive, so be careful where you plant that. I got two little four inch pots from the Grapevine Garden Club plant sale one year, and in one year it was six feet wide, so cannot stay in my garden anymore. But anyway, it had taken over this garden, and daylilies had taken over, and it was just a mess. And again, look at those Burford hollies, excellent shrubs, but they have gotten so out of. Uh, control. Those can be pruned so hard in February. I mean, you can whack those back by half and they will come back just great. Do it in February. So you can see how we tidied all of that up, added some abelias, tidied up the, the um, uh, savannah holly there and lim limbed up the crepe myrtle so that you can, you know, clean all that up. All right, again, dense shade. We all, a lot of us have those situations now where our live oak trees have grown huge and we can't grow anything underneath of it. So mondo grass, regular mondo grass is what I recommend for that dense shade. Uh, not the, the mini mondo or the dwarf mondo because it spreads so slowly, but the regular mondo that grows about six or eight inches tall will, will cover in a year and, and, and handle that deep shade. Again, same thing, post oaks, slope, so we added lots of cobblestone to handle the water coming off the street area. Then we added that large sweep of the mondo grass, and behind that in that bed we put cast iron. Um, so you can just see how that's matured, and it just solved that um, you know, eroding slope. This was a, a garden, is a garden in Grapevine, and you can see the patio off to the left-hand side there and then the street. So they felt like when they were sitting on their patio they were just you know, in everybody's view to the street. So they wanted some screening there, but then you can also see they have a drainage issue right through that area. So what do we do? A creek bed. So I installed a creek bed that goes through this garden, but we installed um, Oakland hollies along the street side so that when they're sitting on their patio, as those uh, shrubs mature, it will give them some screening so they don't look like they're just sitting out there in view of the street. So, and then it just, I think I have another picture of it, how it's maturing here. You could use Nellie R. Stevens holly, Savannah holly. These are Oakland hollies. They say if you want a holly, you don't have to prune. Get Oakland holly because it retains that column or pyramidal form without a lot of pruning. So this garden in, up in Trophy Club, it was just, it, it backs up to a golf course. So they're, they're missing out on that view and looking at this large hedge of Nellie R. Stevens. Nellie R. Stevens, excellent plants. Um, it just keeping them at six feet tall and in a rectangle hedge is, is a lot of work. So we ripped out, we didn't rip them out, we killed them because that would have been a lot of digging. So we cut them off and put stump killer in there to kill them. So this is just showing the garden as it's maturing. This is an upper view of that. So just so much more interesting. And now they can see out to the golf course beyond them instead of having it all blocked off. So this is a small garden in Arlington, and they knew that they were going to have a two-story house built right next to them in their new neighborhood. So we planned to, for screening of that. So you can just see how we added a walkway through there to get through there, and there's um, Nellie R. Stevens holly and Muskogee, Muskogee crepe myrtles that will grow 25 to 30 feet tall, so very large. So the house that's there behind them is a one story, but they knew there was a two story coming even closer with windows that were going to be looking right down onto their patio. So you can see there's the two story. And now you can see how we've accomplished the goal is having they now get to look at those beautiful Muskogee crepe myrtles and their neighbors don't get to look down on them. So this is a garden um, in South Lake. Just wanted a relaxing spot with sh shady plants. So. She just did all of this work herself. Um, crepe myrtle, I mean, uh, um, oak leaf hydrangea, Japanese maple, um, oxalis, ferns, cast iron, all the same cast of characters. This garden was on the Colleyville tour as well. Um, 
the promenade tour. This is um, in actually South Grapevine. So uh, they had Asian jasmine around all of their trees, so had all of that ripped out. And then we added Japanese maples and then uh, lots of shade plantings, leopard plant and um, what else do we have? Oxalis, variegated liriope, a um, little bit of annual color added in there. And so this uh, last spring, they you know, called me back out because the lawn on the left side of their yard was getting worse and worse because the trees were growing. So we ripped that out and added more of the same plantings that we had done on the right side over onto this left side. So it just makes the whole garden flow together. So that ground cover in the front there is um, the strawberry geranium or strawberry begonia. And then another Japanese maple. So this yard in South Lake, this lower area, they had to replace that sod every year and they do it with plugs. So I, I said, well, why, are, why don't you make this a walkway through there? There are garages on the other side, and I'm sure they you know, go back and forth through that all the time, and it was just some muddy mess. So we had the grass removed and then turned it into this beautiful garden. And she got the little bench out there so she can sit and, and enjoy her garden and you know, wave at neighbors when they go by. And so now it has become this beautiful garden. I mean, look at the difference between having to replant that sod every single year and now have, she's created this beautiful shade garden. So this client and Marietta let me know when we're getting kind of close. Um, this garden in um, Hearst, they bought the house from their parents um, when they passed away. So they had old photinias that had been there for ages that were way overgrown. So we just ripped everything out and started with a blank slate. So now this is what this garden looks like. Um, and this is right after it was planted, so I can't wait to see it again as it's maturing. But this garden, we had to get the, ho this, the other homeowner, the neighbor, to go in on it with them because the drainage from both yards goes between the houses. So we added a creek bed, say it with me, a large creek bed that flows between the two yards that takes all their, and the, uh, the gray house there, they had gutters installed and all the gutters now lead to that creek bed. So both houses, their, their gutters lead to the creek bed and carries all that water out to the street without eroding constantly because it's so shady in here they couldn't grow turf grass. So um, just um, the backyard was nothing but a bunch of weeds and tiny little flags or stepping stones there. So we created uh, just a large garden bed in there that they can enjoy and, and put in zoysia grass uh, in their backyard that's doing quite well. Just another view of that, their patio, very small patio right there. And they look out to a park. So we just, ex you know, expanded that, that view out to the park. Same plants, same thing. The one interesting thing about this garden is um, they had um, Chinese ground orchid. Uh, do any of y'all grow that plant? It's got that little grassy look that's right uh, at the base of those oak trees there. And uh, Blatilla is the botanical name of it. Anyway, when I saw that they had that, I thought, we have got to keep this plant. So I had them dig, you know, we had my guys dig all the, that blatilla up, you know, set it to the side. And then when we redid the garden, we put that back in the garden. So it's kind of cool that they've retained something from the old garden that is an excellent plant. It gets this sweet little uh, violet colored bloom on it in the springtime. Really a neat little plant. Uh, this is a, in Trophy Club as well. Um, they, the spot that's over on the right-hand side there uh, used to have a mulberry tree, a mulberry, it was, which is a trash tree, and enormous. It just dwarfed this one-story house. So we had that taken out because I, I don't think they even need a tree in their front yard. And before you take trees out, you, if you're in an HOA, you do have to check that. But um, the only two plants we left in this front garden are the Oakland holly that's over on the left and the... Yopon holly that's over on the right. So we landscaped down the steps and because the whole yard is sloping and the bed along the steps is sloping, I added boulders kind of sporadically up the slope so that if you know any rain that comes down it would you know kind of uh, terrace that area. So added some small variety crepe myrtles on the end and you can see the the Oakland holly that's kind of that egg shape right there. We kept that and then added another Yopon holly that will grow 15 feet and, you, and let it grow into a natural form. We added that on the opposite side of the house so they're now the house is now balanced with more appropriately sized 
uh, trees. They're actually shrubs, but we make them be trees. So, and then this is just how it's progressed over the summer. So now they have this beautiful, you know, walk up to their front door. And there's a fountain up there by the front door and everything too. This soggy side yard, they get drainage from the neighbors. And a lot of times you have to get cooperation with your neighbors because, you know, we're planted, we're, we're, our houses are so close together and one yard drains into the next. So try to get some cooperation with that. But Anyway, um, couldn't grow grass well there, so we added the creek bed to take the neighbor, the yard water from the neighbor, pardon me, and then they needed to walk through that area too. And then again, same plantings, ferns, maples. Um, this garden here in Keller, back when they had sun, they could grow St. Augustine, and this is uh, in the wintertime, so the St. Augustine's dormant, but they could grow a fairly nice stand of it, but as the trees grew from the in the neighbors and their yard, they have an oak they have a live oak and a red oak in this tiny backyard. So anyway, it just turned to mud and they were getting frustrated with it. And he tried to do a creek bed, but notice the downspout coming down and there's no connection between that downspout and the creek bed. So he was frustrated because it kept washing dirt into the creek bed. I said, please let me come over and help you. So now you can see where we've taken the downspout and connected the creek it, the creek bed now connects to the downspout. So when the water comes out, it flows into the creek bed and then added the flagstone and again the dwarf mondo and it's just become this very lovely shady backyard that's functional. All right, this client here, um, she has a gym. Uh, um, she's a fitness trainer. And so her, their garage, they've turned into her gym. And so they wanted a garden that was outside of that um, Jim and they walk out their backyard to go to work. So um, this client did all of the work himself and created this this garden area and he put this flagstone in and then decided it was too small so he redid it and added larger flagstone and then all the perennials and it's just such an inviting place now. I mean wouldn't you love to walk to work going through that? And those poor people who are in there <laughs> having getting all that uh, training, physical training. Now they can look out the window and see something in all their pain. Um, when I give talks on plant material, I just, if you hear nothing else, I say it's right plant, right place. Well, this is the right, it's, it's a right plant. It's a good plant. It's a Nellie R. Stevens holly, and I'm sorry for the quality of the picture. It's, a, I think, a Google Earth picture. Anyway, Nellie R. Stevens planted in absolutely the wrong place. I mean, check this out. They have been pruned within an inch of their life and you know I'm not afraid to prune things but when you are trying to keep a shrub that wants to be 15 feet tall and 10 feet wide and you're trying to grow it in a little two foot bed you're asking way too much out of this plant so uh, rip it out it's it's just in the wrong place so we created this little garden here that is much more appropriately sized to this very small house we added um, a, I don't have my plant list there. Yeah, the burgundy hearts red bud is in the distance there because of this light colored house to have that burgundy foliage. And we planted, you know, the, that tree will get about 15 feet tall and wide. So we planted it at least seven, eight feet from the house so that it, it's not going to smash into the house. And then just added nandinas and abelias. And, and then she doesn't have gutters on the house. So we knew at that valley that water was going to be gushing down. So we added a little cut through of cobblestone. So when the water comes down and, and hits the steps and the sidewalk there, it will go through the bed. And then as it's coming down on the sidewalk, we didn't want it to erode the bed all the time. So we added cobblestone there. And again, these plantings are brand spanking new. So as they grow and fill in, it won't look quite so harsh. Um, this is uh, in South Lake, and this juniper pruned like that, it's just such high maintenance. I, I don't love that kind of maintenance too much. Uh, there's Laura Petalums in there that back by the window that, you know, grow six, eight, nine feet tall and wide. And they are, I do see a lot of stem canker, bacterial gall with those plants right now. So I'm not even using them in, in designs anymore. And there's Indian hawthorns in here that have fungal leaf spot on them. And so just high maintenance and problem plants. So we redid this whole area. We kept one plant. You can see the lollipop uh, mushroom yopon there. So we're gonna grow that out. It's gonna take about three years, but we're gonna grow that out so they have that natural look. But it was, it was in a fine spot and it's a great plant. So we decided to leave it. 
but the rest of the plantings now are appropriately sized for a once a year prune and that's my um, threshold on uh, placement of plants if it can fit that space with a once a year prune hard prune and then maybe a tidy up in the fall that's how I choose the plant material that that will go in that spot um, and then just added annual color um, along the, the front right there and um, you know as the water comes down just hitting the sidewalk it can erode the edges right there so we added the cobblestone and then this yard um, again a huge live oak tree they're not able to grow the grass underneath there anymore the the shrubs had gotten so large it was completely blocking the window those their shrubs were fine plants they're just in the wrong place so we opened it up their son was in the house when those shrubs got taken out and he was like wow it is so bright in here now so um, anyway, we put yopon hollies up against the house so that they will never grow up above those, uh, the bottom of the window again. And then we took all of this um, liriope that's growing at the base of that live oak, and it was uh, scattered around in other parts of the bed, and we divided it and had enough to plant that whole area underneath the live oak. So now we've taken bare earth and turned it into something that will be evergreen and super low maintenance. You just take a weed eater, chop that down in February, and you don't have to touch it again. So, and then we added a walkway and a, through that area. This is the last job that I, one of the last jobs that I've done. This is out in South Lake and huge, huge yard with huge, huge erosion problem. Um, sandy, sandy soil and on a slope. So every time it rained, all of that sand was downhill. And um, they had a creek bed that someone else had installed downhill. So all that sand did nothing but fill up the creek bed and rendered everything unfunctionable. So here they have uh, winter rye or perennial rye. This is, uh, was taken in the early, early spring. So it, it's still growing there, um, but it wouldn't, you know, it, it's, it's an annual. So it wouldn't survive the summer there. Um, and it's too shady to grow turf grass. So what we did is we terraced this yard, so brought in some big boulders to uh, raise up that upper area, and then we used chopped stone to kind of make a smaller um, area to divide off some ground covers. And so that's what that yard looks like now. And up at the upper level there, there's a spring up there, so that area stays very wet. So uh, we ended up planting um, sweet flag, golden sweet flag, which is actually a pond plant. It loves water, so and it spreads. So I knew a clump, it, it spreads by clumping. It's not invasive in the least. But um, I knew that that plant would be so happy up there and would soak up that water, and it gives a real grassy texture. And um, so then we just added a big sweep. I think I've got another picture here. No, just we added a big sweep of that um, Mondo grass because it's very shady. And then we added the Everillo sedge. That's the lime colored grass in there. Um, it, again, will grow 18 inches to 24 inches tall and wide, and it's very drapey. Um, so it, it will just form a really soft, limey green sweep through there. And then holly ferns, um, um, cast iron plant, another Japanese maple, some elephant ears, things like that. So it just took this uh, erosion situation and fixed it because we've had a couple hard rains since then and the client is thrilled because they don't have erosion anymore. The other side of their yard, more shade, more erosion, huge amount of water coming through the side yard. So we did an enormous creek bed that comes off of their driveway. Water comes from across the street, down their driveway and just, you know, rips through the side yard here. So huge creek bed. And this is new plantings as those plants start to grow and soften soften all that rock, um, it will look much better. But we added the Everillo over there, Japanese maple, um, some creeping jenny, ferns, leopard plants, things like that, just to soften that whole area. So um, anyway, I hope that you are inspired by some of these pictures and got some ideas, maybe a different scale, but just to give you some jumping off ideas. And so um, I do have a blog and I have a Facebook page um, if you're interested in checking out, I, I try to post educational things on there, not just all pretty pictures. Yes, Janet. I know you have a lot of creeks. Yes. 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 How do you keep all the leaves and stuff out of there, or do you just go? 
I'm glad that you asked that question. Creek beds do need maintenance in that they need to be blown out. You've got to blow the leaf debris out of that because the leaves will uh, decompose and become compost. And if you don't blow those out, then you're going to fill your creek bed in with compost and it will render it useless. But it's so easy. I mean, just go get you a battery operated blower and zip on through it. It's so easy. I've had my creek bed in for, if not 15 years at least, and still working great. Just blow it out. Yes. How do you keep the grass out of the mulch around the stone walkways? You've had a lot of uh, flagstone walkways, but how do you keep those? The fat method, finger and thumb. No, um, or you know, a lot of times, so I plant the the dwarf mondo in between. So if that gets planted heavily enough, it will crowd out that stuff. Things don't have a place to seed it. The mondo, the, the dwarf mondo, or? No, the, the walkway itself, is it in the construction process? Yes, yes. I mean, we remove any turf grass that's in the area, and they get nestled down into the, the, the mulch in, the, in that area, so they're not all wonky. They're, they're nestled down in there. And sometimes they're set in decomposed granite, and um, that will, you know, decomposed granite is soil. It will grow things, so you're, it's, it's, you're going to have to weed that. And you can do that with little tools, or, or you can use chemicals, but you know, to each your own. Yes. Yeah. Is your once a year prune always in February? My once a year prune for um, things that don't bloom in the springtime, yes, is February. All your hollies, all your liriope, your ornamental grasses, you know, all of those bread and butter shrubs get pruned hard in February. And that's when you can get away with that. And the reason it's February is our last average freeze is mid-March. You back that up three to four weeks. That puts you into mid-February. And so um, you do that hard prune, and it spurs all that new growth. So by the time the new growth comes, the freezes are done. Everybody's happy. If you wait until the plant has put off its new growth, it's expended all that energy, and now you're just cutting it off. I want to see all that new, fresh uh, light green growth. It just, it's just so pretty. And you get rid of all the old, um, like with liriope, when you prune that off, you get rid of all of the tattered little edges and you have all that nice new fresh growth. And it's so easy to, to prune that. But, yeah. but like things like or, um, oh, what else? Um, certainly mop head or macrophylla hydrangeas. You don't want to prune those in February. You're going to cut off the blooms. Um, Things that bloom in, in that April time frame, you don't want to cut those in February. So it's a short list. Did I get you? Yes. Tony, what was the, the plant that you said you had gotten in two small six inch pots? Oh, um, blue mist flower. Blue mist flower, it used to be called Eupatorium coalescinum, and I think it's Conclonium or something like that now. There's a Gregii and a, and a, and a coalescinum. And it's blue mist flower. It's a monarch magnet. It's got that really powdery blue. Uh, it, it, it will attract monarchs like nothing else, but it spreads very readily. So just know that going in. I'm not saying don't plant it. Just know what you're getting into. It took over a whole area of my garden, so I'm like, can't, can't have you here. So, yes. Is this a Distillium, yes. Um, I have, uh, I, I've not done the winter jade. I've done Cinnamon Girl at three different uh, clients. And c Distillium, they're, they're touting it, um, especially dis the Cinnamon Girl, as a great boxwood replacement. It's just, ha it's just a green shrub. Um, it grows about that same size. Some of, there's uh, like copper or something and that winter jade. They all grow larger, so just read the tag on how big they get. But um, it's just a green shrub. It does get a tiny little bloom on it. Uh, that's that's not um, it's, it's nothing to write home about. But it does get a little bloom on it. Um, I've had they all croaked in my yard, so I, I probably was in too much shade. But I saw them at the Dallas Arboretum growing in heavy shade, and they were doing great. But I think they water a little bit more. But I don't know. But my client's experience with them. One is planted on the west side. One is on the east side. One is on the south side, and they're all doing 
like they lost one and they replaced it and now they're all doing fine. Um, so they're, they're touted as like the greatest thing since sliced bread, but um, I don't have enough experience to rave about them, but they're okay. So um, Tony, what is it again? distillium, uh, there's cinnamon girl, which is the smallest one. There's, what is that? What, uh, Vintage jade, there's one that's copper something. Um, there's several varieties out. I've seen them at Landscape Systems, um, Site One. They're, they're newer. I'm trying to think of the grower who, who it's, I don't know that it's a Monrovia or a Southern Living. It might be like a First Editions or something. It might be that uh, brand, so. Yes. Uh, right after they're done blooming. So like if you have Indian hawthorns that are blooming in late March, early April, as soon as they're done blooming, prune them then. And I'm not using a lot of Indian hawthorn anymore because Entomosporium fungal leaf spot and then if there's any leaves left on, the bagworms get them. So I'm done. Two strikes are out. I like easy, easy, yes. I have some leaf spot on a tree that otherwise looks beautiful, has new growth, and uh, is there anything I can do? What kind of tree? I believe it is a wax myrtle. Oh, wax myrtle with leaf spot? Hmm. And they retain their leaves, so... Well, a lot of people had fungal problems this year with the spring. It was cool and it was wet and it just breeds fungal problems. I don't, I mean, I don't know that I would spray. Oh, wax leaf agustrum. Right. Beautiful, fills in the space, gorgeous. Trim it in February, you're going to cut all that off. It's going to put all, all new growth. It'll be fine. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you trim it every year, just cut all that off. Do it in February and cut it hard. You can cut those really hard. They get really big. Thank you. Yeah. Now, I don't use a lot of those. They can have some freeze damage, and they just grow so large. I would rather use a holly as opposed to those. They get seeds on them, and they, they reseed everywhere. So not, not one of my favorites, but, but okay. <laughs> Is that it? Well, thank you all. I enjoyed it.